Hello, everyone. My name is Ji Hyun Song from Korea. I am an emergency physician working in Korea University Ansan Hospital. I'm so pleased to have an opportunity to deliver an online lecture to Asian EMS providers. The title of my presentation is Pathophysiology of Traumatic Brain Injury. This course was initially developed by EPIC TBI project of Arizona and brought to you by AAEMS. We declare that no financial interest or conflict of interest exists. Traumatic brain injury, TBI, is a process, not a single event. In TBI, secondary injury can be more damaging than primary injury. Hypertension, hypoxia, and hyperventilation may cause decreased cerebral blood flow. Finally, cellular damage and cell death can occur. Primary brain injury is damage that occurs at the moment of impact. Primary brain injury is caused by direct contact, acceleration, deceleration, and rotational forces. Primary brain injury includes both focal and diffuse injury. Neurologic deficits often depend on the location and severity of the injury. Primary brain injury includes contusions, hematoma, diffuse axonal injury, direct cellular damage, tearing and shearing of the tissues, loss of the blood-brain barrier, disruption of the neurochemical homeostasis, and loss of the electrochemical function. However, we can't fix it because primary brain injury is irreversible. Neurosurgeon can't fix it either. The damage is already done. Secondary brain injury occurs after the initial trauma. Secondary brain injury results from cellular hypoxia. It is caused by systemic hypoxia and poor CNS blood flow. Secondary brain injury has a major impact on TBI outcome. Every aspect of pre-hospital TBI treatment is about preventing secondary brain injury. We should avoid the H-bombs. In the TBI, H-bombs means hypoxia, hypertension, and hyperventilation. H-bombs kill neurons and cause lives. EMS providers should treat even a single episode of H-bomb. Brain consumes 20% of the body's total oxygen requirement and 15% of total cardiac output. Brain is exquisitely sensitive to ischemia and low oxygen states. Intracranial contents are 80% brain tissue, 10% blood, and 10% cerebrospinal fluid. An increase in the volume of any of these intracranial contents causes increased intracranial pressure. First, the brain can swear cerebral edema. Second, excess blood can accumulate due to hemorrhage. Third, CSF can accumulate due to blockage of outflow. Hypoxia might be caused by brain hemorrhage or a patient's inability to maintain airway after sustaining a head injury. Normal cellular metabolism is heavily dependent on oxygen. Previous study reported that oxygen saturation below 90% is independently associated with a doubling of mortality. Autoregulation is impaired in many traumatic brain injury patients, which results in cellular hypoxia in the setting of even mild, modest drops in blood pressure. 
Previous studies showed that a single episode of hypertension, systolic blood pressure below 90 millimeter mercury, were associated with a doubling of mortality in TBI. Low blood pressure can decrease cerebral perfusion, which worsens brain damage. Hyperventilation can at least double the mortality of TBI patients. Extreme hyperventilation may increase mortality about sixfold. It also causes profound cerebral vasoconstriction and severe cellular hypoxia. Ventilating EMT or ventilator should avoid hyperventilation because it can significantly increase secondary injury. An elevation in ICP further reduces the CPP and cerebral blood flow. Elevated ICP can cause direct compressive damage to the brain tissue and lead to ischemia from the compression of the vasculature. Herniation of brain tissue and brain death can occur. Hyperventilation was shown to reduce ICP, but the vasoconstriction caused by reducing CO2 levels also leads to cerebral ischemia. Even short periods of hyperventilation can cause hypocarbia, decreased cerebral perfusion, and cerebral blood flow, and may result in increased morbidity and mortality. This is the mechanism of secondary injury induced during hyperventilation. If EMS provider conduct hyperventilation in patients with endotracheal tube intubation, it may increase intrathoracic pressure. This may decrease mean arterial pressure and increase jugular venous pressure. These conditions result in decreased CNS perfusion. Hyperventilation also may cause decreased PaCO2, which may lower CNS vasoconstriction, calcium protein influx to, into cells, and left shift of oxygen hemoglobin curve. These conditions might result in decreased CNS perfusion apoptosis, neuronal death, and decreased oxygen delivery to CNS. This is the summary of my presentation. Secondary brain injury is what happens when EMS providers does not pay close attention to oxygen saturation, blood pressure, and ventilation rate. We should avoid hypoxia hypertension, and hyperventilation in TBI patients. Thank you for your attention.